Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, today we do honor a part of your creation. Uh, you've made us for your glory. And so in all things that we do, men, women, children, whoever we are, we want to live for your glory. And we do echo the frames of that song, uh, yet not I, but Christ in me. So let that be our testimony today, Lord, as we uh, hear from your word. Help me to speak it in a way that's exciting and encouraging and challenging and hopeful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a couple or three weeks ago when Scott asked me if I was available on this Sunday to speak, uh, he mentioned that it was Mother's Day. And immediately uh, my mind went to a sermon years and years ago, 30, 40 years ago. I had uh, scheduled kind of a series of topics over the next two or three months and you know, hadn't really looked ahead at the dates to see when was Mother's Day, Father's Day, any special day, Valentine's or whatever. And so it just by coincidence turned out that the topic on that Mother's Day was hell. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I was young and foolish. And rather than shifting my schedule, I just charged right on through it. <laughs> was not a happy Mother's Day in my home or in most others in our church. So Scott had said, you can speak on any of the gifts of the Spirit. You can do something on Mother's Day. You can do whatever you want to do. And I told him that story, and he goes, anything but that. <laughs> so so we're, we're going to attempt to bring something that's... Um, encouraging and helpful today. I, I have noticed over the years as I've had occasion to sit on Mother's Day and hear other ministers speak, it is a day in which we can just offend women. We don't intend to. It just happens. I just know one senior pastor that I was his assistant, he has made the single women mad every year. I mean, every he just did. I mean, they would, and we were, the least and I kind of were over the singles ministry at that time. And we would hear it the next week of how offended they were that they were not acknowledged and cared for and concerned about. <clears throat> so I, I've learned from that to try to be pretty broad and inclusive. But I do think that Mother's Day is fraught with some challenges. And so I'm going to give you four disclaimers this morning, <laughs> just to get this introduced and get rocking here, okay? So the first landmine to me is you have asked a man to speak on Mother's Day. <laughs> I was like, what do I know about motherhood other than observing it from a distance? However, years ago I picked up this book, it's titled... Everything men know about women. Okay? <laughs> Small book. It's true. Small book. So the back cover kind of gives a little summary. Famed psychologist Alan Lowell Francis, whoever that is, has written a landmark book on men's understanding of that most complex of all creatures, women. Based on years of research and interviews with thousands of men from all walks of life, he presents the most complete picture ever revealed of men's knowledge of their opposite sex. <laughs> Fiercely frank and brilliantly insightful, this work spells out everything men know about such topics as making friends with women, romancing women, achieving emotional intimacy with women, making commitments to women. The Times gave it four stars. The Chronicle says it all. Everything men know about women. I drew deeply upon this book and this resource today. So you open the book and you discover that every page is blank. So based upon that, I am totally qualified to share this sermon with you today. <laughs> So that's the first. 
Uh, the second I will note this, it's not a biblical holiday. Now, all through the Bible, we find admonitions to honor our mothers. So there's plenty in there about mothers, but it's not a biblical holiday. I, I won't share with you the history of Mother's Day just for sake of time, but somebody, sometime go back and Google that and see how Mother's Day got started in the early 1800s. The third disclaimer is that our culture today confuses us so much, so much about what we can and cannot say to women or about women. Our culture is just, it's a, it's a messy thing right now related to women. I work with women at the bank and, you know, uh, they know me well enough that uh, we can joke and tease about a lot of things, but boy, you got to walk carefully. And fourthly, I just will say, and this may be really seriously the biggest concern that I would have today, uh, there is a plethora of emotions surrounding Mother's Day. We have women who lost their children through a miscarriage. They may have died at birth or died later prematurely. Our youngest daughter-in-law and our son, uh, their first child was born, uh, I think, 26 weeks and he lived 42 days, died on New Year's Day of that year. Uh, so we understand the sorrow of the loss of a child. It's tragic. It's devastating. Many of you ladies may have experienced that in your, in your marriage and in your life. And we express our sympathy, our concern for that. We have single mothers who are single either because they were abandoned or widowed or maybe a, a lot of other reasons that they're alone in their life trying to raise their children. And it's a challenge for them to do so. We have single women who long to marry and have children. We learned when we were overseeing the singles ministry down in Birmingham, Alabama, that um, the women who were single in our singles group, which ranged everywhere from, uh, from late teens into their 50s who had just never married. And one of the things that we kind of discovered about those women who were single and longing to be married, they thought of themselves as not yet married. And so we understood that there was a longing for them. So we understand that that is a challenge. We have women and men sitting here this morning who perhaps never knew your natural mothers uh, maybe you were fostered and perhaps adopted. Delise and I uh, had never intended to foster, but in, um, in our youngest son, uh, as he was uh, mid-high school and forward, had a young friend that played basketball with him on the high school team, and he had been in the same foster home for most of his life, but he was just a handful, and his foster family said, I, we they just told the state, we need a break. We can't do this anymore. Our son came home. Mom and dad, can we take Jeremy? Can he come live with us? Well, he had been over to our house many times and spent the night with us. We knew him quite well and knew his foster parents quite well. And uh, we said, yes, the state, because he was 15 years old at the time, uh, didn't find too many people, too many families that would accept a 15-year-old into their home. You have to get certified in states to be foster parents, of course. And and uh, we had not done any of that, but the state, because we were willing to take him in, granted us uh, an exception that we could go ahead and have him move in with us, and then we would do all the home studies and do the classes and the training and certification. Jeremy was with us till he was 18 years old, and it was a challenge almost every day. Uh, we, we knew his teachers at school more than we knew our own kids' teachers. Almost daily, not quite, but almost daily, I would get call, a call from the local high school to come down and see about Jeremy. When you go into the schools, I don't know if you do that now, but when we did then, um, had to go in the office, sign in, get a little badge to wear saying you have authority to be here. <clears throat> After the first year of that, uh, the next year started and started off about the same. Jeremy needed somebody to come down and see about him at class. And I went into the school and they said, uh, Mr. Goodson, uh, we know that you're Jeremy's foster father, and we, um, we know that you're going to be in here a lot. 
And so we've just had a badge made up with your name on it. You're free. You don't have to check in the office. We know you're a pastor in the community. We know you from, from our community. And so anytime you need to come in, don't worry about checking in. You can just go straight on to see Jeremy and take care of him. <laughs> so <clears throat> we know the challenges that face women. We've lived them ourselves as grandparents losing a son and sitting there um, around 1 a.m. on New Year's Day, seeing our son and daughter-in-law hold him in their laps. And I still have a mental picture, a very vivid mental picture of his little chest heaving and relaxing as he breathed and took his last breaths. And I remember uh, seeing that last heave of his chest. And when he sighed, I knew it was over. It's no fun in that. Nothing whatsoever. Our son and daughter-in-law struggled through that massively. They lived far away from us, and, but he would call me almost daily. And, Dad, how? And he was a youth pastor, by the way, at the time. And he would say, Dad, how can, how can I serve a God who took my son? Deep pain. And we prayed together on the phone, and we talked, and we wrestled through that for the next couple of years with them. And he came through it. They came through it. Many marriages could be challenged in that time. Marriages could fall apart when there's been the death of a child. But they hung in there and made it through it. I always felt like when he called, I had to give him some kind of answer. You know, that pastoral side of me that had to give him an answer to his questions. And one day he said, Dad, he said, I don't need a pastor today. I just need a dad. He said, I know all the answers you're telling me. I do. And he said, we're just resting. But he said, I just need a dad who will listen today. And so we got through all of it. So for me to stand up here and speak to you on, on a Mother's Day, understand I don't know a mother's heart. But I do know a father's heart, and it's pretty similar, I think, when it comes to our children. And so I realize we're kind of going into this sermon today with a few challenges. I may say something that offends somebody. Please, I don't intend to, of course. So we're going to take off on this thing with a little video that I think will encompass what I've tried to say to introduce this sermon today. Would you go ahead and play that? <clears throat> Today is Mother's Day, and we want to acknowledge all the women we're blessed to know. We rejoice over you, for your strength, your wisdom, your strong love, and your beautiful faith. Whether today is a celebration for you or a day of quiet reflection and healing, we're thinking of all of you. If you gave birth this year to your first child, our joy overflows and we celebrate with you. If you adopted a child this year or became a foster parent, we rejoice with you and we want to honor you in your commitment to changing the lives of children. If you continue to struggle with infertility, we are hoping with you and holding your hand in prayer. If you are exhausted and feeling underappreciated for all you do for a house full of kids, we applaud you. We love you and we appreciate you more than you can ever imagine. And if you lost a child this year to death or miscarriage, we weep and mourn with you. And if your child is lost to addiction or to the world, we hurt with you and we join you in putting our hope in the one who brings prodigals home. If you live with painful memories of your mom, we pray that you will find in a spiritual mother all that you never had from a birth mom. And if you're one of those amazing spiritual moms, we thank you for stepping up and being there when others couldn't. If you're experiencing an empty nest for the first time this year, we walk with you in this new season and are excited about the next chapter God has planned for you. 
If you're single, we celebrate your strength, beauty, and individuality, and join with you in praying for the desires of your heart. If you're a single mom and wonder if you have the physical energy and financial resources to raise and provide for your child or children, we want to help you, and we will. And if you're pregnant for the first time, we prayerfully anticipate with you the joyful birth of a healthy child. And to all the special women on this Mother's Day, rest and delight in knowing that we are thankful for you, and we celebrate each and every one of you. <clears throat> well, hopefully that encompasses where you might be in your life as a mother, as a family with children. Uh, take courage, take, ho take hope. God loves you, cares for you deeply, and uh, will see us all through the tough times in life. Amen? Amen. So uh, today, I, I did just want to talk with you a little bit about some of the remarkable women of the Bible. Most of these, you'll find that they may have had children, but there are some single mothers in here as well. There are so many women of the Bible, I discovered when I started researching this again, that there's just no way to cover all of them. I actually hope that I cover two or three women of the Bible you might not have been as familiar with and just see something of their lives and how they walked with God and how their faith sustained them both through the Old Testament and through the New Testament. So I don't have any deep spiritual theological uh, truth or insight to bring you. I just want to tell you some stories of some of these remarkable women of the Bible. And I believe that as I do, God will reveal to you things that will speak to your heart and your spirit in the season that you're in right now as well. I love to tell stories anyway, so I just get to tell stories about other people today. So I started off with Moses' mother. How many of you know Moses' mother's name? I'm sure some of you might, but yeah, so one back there. Anybody else today? A couple of people, three or four? Well, let me tell you, Moses' mother's name was Jochebed. J-O-C-H-E-B-E-D, Jochebed. And of course, you'll probably remember the story of the Israelites being in captivity in Egypt and as they continued to work as slaves and labored through those uh, many years, uh, Israel grew and they multiplied and the Hebrew women were prolific in producing children. The Pharaoh began to get concerned that too many men were growing up in Israel, and they would soon outnumber the Egyptians or at least feel like they could overtake them and rebel against Egypt. And so at one point, the Pharaoh said, from henceforth, all the midwives that help these Israelite ladies give birth, uh, we want you to catch the baby and take it away and destroy it before the mom sees it. But the midwives were concerned about that. They didn't want to do that. They felt terrible about it. And so they would just give the excuse to the Egyptians that these Hebrew women give birth so quickly, which is true of our youngest daughter-in-law. She just had number seven biologically, and uh, they've adopted a set of three siblings, so 10 kids. We have 16 grandchildren now and one great-granddaughter. Amazing. And so the midwives were saying, these Hebrew women deliver so quickly, we can't get there in time to catch that baby and do something else with him. So then Pharaoh said, okay, we're going to require you to kill all the Hebrew babies, the boys that are born. So along comes Moses. His mother's extremely concerned and fearful for that, of course, she nursed him for about three months and then realized that she was going to be found out. She put him in a basket in the river. I'm sure with the hope and expectation that some other mother, perhaps they knew that the Pharaoh's daughter would stroll along that river with her maidens and hopeful that someone would find Moses and take care of him. She stationed Miriam, 
Moses' sister, to kind of watch what was going on with Moses in the basket. And uh, so Miriam realized one day that the Pharaoh's daughter was coming along and found Moses, found him a lovable child, kept him safe, took him from the river and said she would take him home. Miriam says, hey, princess, you're going to need somebody to help nurse this baby and take care of him. I, I know somebody who can do that. So she gets her mom, Jacobet who's brought into the courts along with Moses for probably five or six years until he was weaned. And he grew up in the courts of Pharaoh. So three amazing women. One of them I'm sure you won't think about as being an amazing woman, but first of all, Jochebed, an amazing woman, gave up her son for adoption. Have you thought about it in those terms? Gave up her son, Moses, for adoption to save his life. Then we have the Pharaoh's daughter. You don't think about her as a, an amazing, remarkable woman of the Bible, perhaps. But she adopted Moses. So she was an adoptive mother. Raised him in the courts of Pharaoh. There's a tradition. Some scholars agree or not. So there's nothing biblical about this. But there's some tradition that says that while Jochebed was in the courts of Pharaoh, uh, nursing and taking care of Moses, that the Pharaoh's daughter heard this and began to accept the God of the Hebrews and began to take on the culture of the Hebrew nation herself. Some say, I think this is a little bit of a stretch, but it just there are always things to think about, right? And so... Um, there is some thought that because the Pharaoh's daughter took on the faith of the Hebrews, that she actually was in the Exodus when the Israelites left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. And even some thought that when the Israelites built the golden calf and worshipped it while Moses was in the mountain, that the Pharaoh's daughter was one of those people who did not bow to that idol. I don't know. It's just a kind of a thing to think about. It may or may not be true. I sure, certainly wouldn't go, boy, that's a biblical thing. And boy, we ought to hang our hat on that. But we do know that she was an adoptive mother. And then you got to think about Miriam, who was there as Moses' big sister, watching over him, finding a way to keep her mom involved in his life. And when they crossed the Red Sea, Miriam was the one who led the women of Israel and a great celebratory dance and song. So, great women of the Bible. Would you agree with me on that? We go next to uh, Rahab. Just an interesting story with Rahab when Joshua was ready to go into Jericho and the walls were going to fall down and they marched around the city. Before they went in, Joshua sent two spies into the city just to kind of find out what the conditions were. And uh, they were found out that they were in the city as spies. And so they had gone into Rahab the harlot's home and she had sympathy for them, was concerned about them, knew the history of Israel. She says, everyone here in Jericho is fearful of Israel because we've heard the great miracles that took place and we know we're doomed. That's what Rahab said. And she said, and she let them down over the wall. They escaped back to Israel and later conquered the city. And she said, when you come back, please spare me and my household. And they did. And then, crazily enough, it turns out that Rahab married a guy named Salmon. We don't know anything about Salmon. We assume he was there in Israel at the time, and one of the men of Israel. Um, they married, and their son was Boaz. You might remember Boaz, who married Ruth. If you remember the story of Ruth and Naomi, I'm not going to go through that whole thing. But the great truth that came out of Ruth's story in the Bible was that Boaz was her kinsman redeemer. That's who Jesus is for us. He came after his people. He gave his life for his people and he redeemed us out of sin and slavery and defeat. So Rahab married Salmon. They had Boaz. Boaz married Ruth. They had Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse and Jesse was the father of David. And so Rahab, in the lineage of Jesus, was the great-great-grandmother of David. 
And Ruth was the great-grandmother of David. Both of these women, Ruth and Rahab, were not of, of the tribes of Israel. They were outsiders to the family of God, as it were. Aren't you thankful today that God went outside his family of believers and brought the Gentiles in? Great kinsman redeemer story. It's a sermon all in itself sometime. This is what was said about Rahab in Hebrews 11, that great hall of fame of faith, right? It says about Rahab, by an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho harlot, welcomed the spies and escaped the destruction that came on those who refused to trust God. And so Rahab foreshadows our salvation by faith. Great woman of the Bible. We can't skip Hannah. Hannah was married to Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. You find this in 1 Samuel. And uh, Hannah was Elkanah's favorite of the two wives. But Penina was the one who was having children. And Hannah was barren. And every year they would go up to the tabernacle in Shiloh and they would make their sacrifices. And year after year after year, Hannah would go before the altar and pour out her soul to the Lord saying, why am I not having a child? Elkanah told her, he says, is my love for you not worth more than 10 sons? Guess what that answer was? She's like, I, I love you, Elkanah, but I need a son. And so year after year, the Bible says that in bitterness, she poured out her soul. In fact, so much at one point that Eli the priest came in and saw her over in prayer and uh, saw her lips moving, but was hearing nothing that was being said. And he thought she was drunk early in the morning and he accused her of that. And she said, my soul is in bitterness. I cannot have a child. And I so long for one and desperate to have a child. And Eli says to her, I will pray that the God of heaven will see your plight and give you the desires of your heart. And at that same time next year, because Hannah had continued to pray and she said, God, if you will just give me a son, if you will just give me a son, I will dedicate him to you. I will give him into your service. And a year later, she came back to the tabernacle in Shiloh with her son, Samuel. And after she had weaned him, five or six years old again, probably, she gave him over to Eli the priest. And you know the story of Samuel growing up in, in the tabernacle and serving with Eli. An amazing story. The women of the Bible have given up their children to dedicate them to the Lord. And I know every mother sitting here today has in some way in your own heart dedicated your children to the Lord. Raising children is challenging, joyful, scary, frustrating, defeating. Can't tell you how many times that um, Delise and I would do something uh, that didn't turn out well with our children. And so many times, Delise in particular would say, well, there goes mother of the year. Didn't get that this year. And in spite of the failures that we have as parents, our frailties, our misunderstanding of our kids, somehow God loves them and cares for them. And God loves them and cares for them whether they follow after the Lord or not. He still cares. We're very blessed and grateful to have three sons who all walk with the Lord and love God, serving in their churches in, in whatever ways they find. Uh, but raising children is tough. I've often said, actually, that I think sometimes it's harder to be the parents of adult children who have left home than it is actually raising them. You guys, you know what I mean, right? Listen, this is no surprise. I mean, I was shocked by that, but I just thought, you know, when, I'm, when we're raising those kids, 
we have authority in their lives to say, this is the way it's going to be. Here are the rules of our house. You know, you got to got to live with that. And our boys did a pretty good job of that. They weren't perfect, but they did a pretty good job of it. But some don't do a good job with that. And some don't walk with the Lord. And some fall away. And as parents, we pray and we intercede. And we try to lead them back to the Lord. We try to give the gospel to them. We try to give them a, a chance in life to walk with God. But I have discovered that just because you're a Christian family raising your kids in a Christian home, there's no guarantee that they're going to walk with the Lord. I've also seen horrible, ungodly parents who have abused their kids, and the kids have no reason whatsoever from the family perspective to grow up and be followers of God. They still do so. Ungodly families produce godly children, sometimes. Godly families don't always produce godly children. And if you're in that place today and you're wondering, how do I reach my kids? Honey, you just keep praying. You just pray. And you pray. And you intercede. And you don't quit. And you find times when you're ready to give up. And you think, I don't see any hope But hope is always alive in Christ because it's not a hope of this world. It's a hope of another world. It's a hope of the eternal. <clears throat> I'm trying to think how to say this and not leave everything on camera here, okay? Um, let me just say we have some relatives, I'll put it that way, that have not walked with God. And as a young man got off into drugs and everything else. Not walking with God. Messed up his life. We love him. He spent 10 months living with us a few years ago. <laughs> Some of the hardest 10 months we ever had. Uh, still not walking with God. Every time I think it's about time to give up hope, and I'm so frustrated with praying for him, God gives us a little spark of hope. And you just keep praying. God will redeem. This one young man had a child. Not walking with God. Named this little girl, our great granddaughter. Named her name. That means, and, and I mean, they had no idea. Had no idea. The name means answered prayer. You know, just at the point where we were like, how do you keep praying for this guy? And I looked up the name, beautiful, precious little girl. Answered prayer. Our grandson has no idea. <laughs> but we're believing. So moms, if you're in that place where you're interceding and praying for one of your children who's not walking with God, you just hang in there. You just don't quit. You keep bombarding the gates of heaven with your petitions. And you may be praying in bitterness of soul. God sees you, okay? He hears you. Keep praying. One of my favorite women, one of my favorite stories of women today in this sermon kind of starts with a man, Simon of Serene. You remember Simon of Serene? He and his two sons, Rufus and Alexander, were in Jerusalem for the Passover. The very Passover, Jesus was being crucified. And as Jesus is carrying his cross to Golgotha, they pulled Simon out of the crowd and said, here, carry this cross. His two sons, Rufus and Alexander, witnessing all of this. Jewish family just hadn't met the Messiah yet. But they met him on that day when dad carried the cross for Jesus. 
And um, we don't hear anything much more about Rufus and Alexander or even much more about Simon throughout the rest of the biblical narrative there. But when Paul had written the letter to the Romans in the last chapter, he was commending the leadership, the leaders in Rome, in the church there. Many of them were women that he was commending. But he said, and this is Romans 16, verse 13, he said, greet Rufus, okay, son of Simon. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Don't know Simon's wife's name, Rufus and Alexander's mother's name. We don't know it. It's not listed there. We don't see it biblically. But apparently Simon and Rufus and Alexander, after carrying the cross up Golgotha, had gone back to see Mama And they must have been impacted very deeply in their lives and became a follower of Christ. Because the Apostle Paul, the big man, you know, the gospel carrier, thanked and commended and said, greet your mother, Rufus, because she was like a mother to me. Think about how incredible that is. A woman that we don't even have named in the Bible, unless I've missed it somewhere, gave her life to following Christ and encountered the Apostle Paul and was part of discipling him, you have to know. You just have to assume that, right? I love Rufus's mom, (laughs) whatever her name is. What a great story. There are women sitting here today that you're a spiritual mother to somebody. We honor you. We need you. You're doing an amazing job. We look to you. We hear from you. I think of Anna in the New Testament, whose husband died when they were very young. She never remarried, and she was 84 years old and still appearing in the temple daily to pray and intercede for the coming of the Messiah and was there to herald that along with Simon, a priest who was there day in and day out in prayers for the coming of the Messiah. He said, my eyes have seen the Messiah. Anna was there praying, pray, pray, seek God, don't give up. How are we doing? Um, Oh, I got to do this one and then I'll wrap it up. I I won't get everything. There, There are so many women of the Bible we could talk about. I can't even get to all of them I put on my list and I kept cutting it down. (laughs) So... So I love the story also of Paul and Silas. They're traveling in what is today Turkey, Asia Minor at that time. And at one point, Paul and Silas had kind of gotten up to the, the, the west coast of Turkey. And they kept trying to go further north toward what we know today as uh, Istanbul. They kept trying to go that direction to share the gospel. And Paul wrote and said, but the Spirit hindered us. I always thought that was fascinating. The Holy Spirit hindered Paul and Silas from going where they wanted to go. Another time in Thessalonians, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and he said, I've tried to come to you two or three times, but Satan has hindered me. Gosh, to have the discernment, right, on a daily basis, to know whether it's the Holy Spirit hindering us or whether it's Satan hindering us. But they were trying to go up there and Paul had a vision in the night, and it says this, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia beseeching him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, uh, Macedonia, assuredly concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. So Paul and Silas at this point make their way across the Aegean Sea. I believe I'm right about that, the Aegean Sea. And they go into Macedonia, which was a part of Greece, and their first foray into Europe. And so Paul and Silas go down by the river where women are praying, and they meet their uh, Hebrew businesswoman named Lydia. She was from Thyatira, which was over in Turkey. Thyatira was known for its producing uh, purple dyes, and so she produced clothing with those purple dyes very uh, popular and very common among royalty of that day. 
She's probably a woman of means. It's thought she is. Well, she's called a businesswoman. And Paul and Silas shared the gospel with them. Lydia is the first recorded European convert. Think about that, folks. Think about where a lot of us came from. I mean, if the gospel had not spread into Europe. What if Paul and Silas had made it on up to Istanbul and headed back east at that point and forsaken getting to Europe? Well, it's a question to ask, but God is big enough that he could use somebody else. So we're not too concerned about that. But aren't you excited that Paul and Silas came into Philippi, a, a Roman city in Greece, and there found Lydia? In the same chapter of Acts 16, Paul and Silas encountered this Greek slave girl who was a, a diviner. She was a fortune teller and followed along after them and called out who they were, but she was possessed of demons. And Paul turned around and rebuked them. You know who the second convert that is recorded in Europe is? A little slave girl whose name we don't know. We have no idea who she is. And then Paul and Silas, because they had delivered this, because God had delivered this little slave girl from divination, it took away the income of her handlers. And they got arrested and put in jail. And you might remember that Paul and Silas sang at midnight. The walls were shaken, the cells were shaken. They were out. The Roman jailer was going to kill himself, commit suicide. Paul says, wait, don't do that. And the third convert that we have recorded in Europe was a Roman jailer. So we have, we have a Hebrew businesswoman. We have a Greek slave girl. We have a Roman centurion. Two out of the first three converts that are recorded in Europe were women. We bow down. <laughs> we thank you. Just amazing stories of women who did great and amazing and miraculous things. All right, let's skip a couple over here. Oh, I do have to say, I will tell this one. At the tomb, Mary Magdalene was the first person, not the first lady, the first person that Jesus revealed himself to and said, I'm risen. That was Mary Magdalene. She runs back to the upper room and brings the disciples and they all see it. I just think there's something significant about that, ladies. I think you hear from God. <laughs> I think you hear from God a lot. My wife hears from God, and she scares me. <laughs> I've got to wrap this up. My goodness. Um, ooh, Philip, the evangelist, had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Just saying. Hebrews chapter 11 is that roll call of faith. Can I just read a, a portion of it? And I'll wrap it up with this. He had already commended several women, men of the Old Testament and, and of Scripture that had done great and amazing feats. And he continues here. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight. And then the next sentence says, women received back their dead by resurrection. Right in the midst of all of these powerful, amazing things that men were doing, he says, and women received back their dead in resurrection. Incredible, incredible stories of these women. So ladies, can I just say what an amazing role you play. We need you in the church. We recognize you all, your joys, your disappointments, your failures, your expectations, your victories, your intercession, your calling back from the dead spiritually with your children and your families and we just honor you today. We thank you for what you do in the kingdom of God. We so need you. Please don't ever feel that there's a second class place in the kingdom of God for you. I think many of you women 
are going to be leading the procession when Christ brings in his family. It's going to be a great day, amen. We're going to be there. And so, ladies, thank you, thank you. God, thank you, thank you today. Thank you, Lord.